just as, as a last question, because I'm sure um, our students listening to you and, and probably are very interested, but are a little bit jumping on their seat saying, but what about what's happening right now with the presidential um, race in the United States with so much uncivil language, yeah. intolerance being expressed quite openly, if not uh, racist uh, speech mm -hmm. as part of the presidential um, rhetoric. What does the tolerant society teach us about this presidential race? Mm -hmm. what, what does it tell us? Well, I think it is uh, very disturbing, of course, to hear uh, things that are being said and proposed uh, today. Uh, and yet, I think a deep understanding of freedom of speech teaches one that you should expect this, mm. that we have gone through periods like this, far worse than this. Maybe we are entering a period that is as bad or worse than those, but as of right now, uh, one would have to say uh, we have been through this before. Uh, the primary reason for understanding uh, the world in that way is that it makes the point sharply that freedom of speech is not only about protecting people for uh, speaking, it's about an understanding of the human condition, about human nature, about what we strive for, about what we will achieve and get if we do are successful in that, and that it has to be won through constant work and effort. It's not something that you can say, we've achieved it, that's the end, it's now going to be good. Quite the contrary, it is something that is only won through exercise mm -hmm. and through um, educating and uh, developing in every generation a commitment to this. So, uh, so my view is that uh, this is a time uh, in which freedom of speech and press, as we're talking about it and as we've known it, is being tested. Yeah. And we have to think of it that way, but we have to understand that it's something that, uh, that is to be expected and that we must, uh, we must be able to articulate it and act on it uh, in order to preserve it. You are not adopting at all a balancing approach to no. that. So for you, the social cost associated with letting those ideas being uttered, including by very powerful individuals, mm -hmm. is nothing compared to the possible cost of curtailing that expression. How can, can that concept be um, explained to, you know, to, to, to the young generation who uh, find it very difficult, very, they are very idealistic, they don't espouse those ideas, you know, th they find it amazing that people should be allowed to utter such um, things in mm -hmm. the context of a presidential race. The social cost of saying those things is mitigated by what? Mm -hmm. So I would put it a little differently from what you said, Agnes, right at the beginning. Uh, I put it more in terms of an of an aspiration, not only the okay. cost, not only the relative costs mm -hmm. of allowing speech and censoring uh, speech, not the comparative cost, but what are we trying to become as people, as a society, as a world? What do we start with in our natures that um, uh, we need to address? Uh, what will we be as people if we are successful in um, in organizing ourselves in this way? And, and understanding that comprehensively uh, is what I think is absolutely crucial uh, to continuing to have it. You can't just have it and then forget it with the reasoning and then have it continue. It won't work that way. You have to continue uh, to, to work at it. All that said, 
the whether whatever theory or principle you take, I think, to freedom of speech and press, you have to be prepared to continue to debate and discuss whether that is right. So, mm -hmm. for example, I, you're referring, I believe, uh, to what we might fairly call hate speech or mm -hmm. uh, speech that uh, denigrates uh, uh, people, uh, innocent people, uh, that uh, tries to uh, evoke an invidious discrimination against uh, people. Should that be protected? Is that part of a world in which we uh, want to live and, and why? I've given my yeah. arguments yeah. about this and you would have your uh, ideas and theories and we've developed a kind of way of thinking and, and talking about this. Um, but we all know or should know that the, uh, the, the it's a hard problem. Mm. Uh, just and to say it's a hard problem, um, but it's different from Skokie. Yeah, yeah. It's different from having um, a group of fairly, uh, from people living a little bit on the side, you know, on the sideline of society wanting to march in a Jewish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Here we have a very central, a very mainstream, uh, the embodiment mm -hmm. of the American political process. So I think this, to me, is where the, why mm -hmm. it's a little bit more challenging. I think mm -hmm. you and I will completely agree on the, the sideline, ultra, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, what do we do when this discourse becomes uh, the, a, the embodiment of a very mainstream political party, at least for the next six months, um, and um, is spread, is, uh, distributed, circulated in prime time television. I mean, isn't there a cost there? Aren't we um, confronting the risk that this kind of speech, or rather the ideas associated with the speech, will not be combated well enough and will become far more ingrained in our society? So I, I understand uh, the line of thinking, I think. Uh, but you are not proposing that uh, we censor no. or legally censor no. uh, speech because it becomes uh, extremely powerful. We're no. not. We're not. You're not proposing that. So, so I think on the principle of freedom of speech, I think we say <clears throat> we have embraced a doctrine that speech that is deeply hurtful to uh, groups and individuals within the society and dangerous in terms of what it might inspire yeah. except for extremely dangerous situations mm -hmm. that would be very hard to define but except for extremely uh, dangerous situations of imminent uh, sort of harms of a, a certain kind except for that we are going to live with this and use the tools we have to be able to combat this, and that's primarily counter speech and organizing and so on. Now, why do we do that? That's, I think, the key part. People, if you don't understand what you're trying to achieve, if it's hollow, if it's just that's the doctrine, that's what we've, mm -hmm. then I think uh, we've lost an enormous yeah. amount. It's what do we aspire to be as people, individuals, as a society? Why are we organizing ourselves in this way, in these ways? And why is it still valid uh, to do that? Listening, of course, to other people who say, but I share the goals, but I think we should do it in a different way. Uh, that will be a perpetual debate of mm -hmm. humankind, mm -hmm. not only here, but everywhere. And, but that's that vigorous, uh, understanding, mm -hmm. vital understanding of what it, we are doing, I think, is absolutely crucial. And it also begins to answer uh, the very acts of, of um, uh, uh, hateful, offensive mm -hmm. speech that you're alluding to. Yeah. So ultimately, 
these are the kind of testing time out of which we can emerge stronger as a society, as a collective. We take a risk. Um, as uh, Holmes said, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, free speech is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. We, we think we understand, we, we think we understand ourselves, what we need. Uh, this is what we've decided, but we, we have to be prepared to think this through again and again and again. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you. President Lee Bollinger. Thank you.